Welcome to this presentation on To the End of the World, Nathaniel Green, Charles Cornwallis, and the Race to the Dam. I'm your author, Andrew Waters. In the following presentation, I will provide a broad overview of the action during and leading up to the Race to the Dam, Nathaniel Green's historic retreat across South and North Carolina during the winter of 1780. For more information about this incredible period of American history, I encourage you to read the book. And now, let's join the race to the Dan. It had been a cold, wet, hard winter, and no doubt the words inside Guilford Courthouse on February 9, 1780 were spoken with frost. There, Nathaniel Green, Major General of the Continental Army and Commanding Officer of the Continental Army Southern Department, called a council of officers. It was a rare occasion. I call no councils of war, and I communicate my intentions to very few, Green had boasted just a month before. But the landscape of the American Revolution had shifted within that month, and Green now faced a decision in which rested the fate of the American South. Green and his Continental Army, accompanied by scattered regiments of Whig, or Patriot, militia, had been retreating across North Carolina for the last three weeks, desperate to avoid being pinned against one of the state's numerous rivers by the pursuing British Army of Charles Cornwallis. At Guilford Courthouse, Green's army consisted of a little less than 1,500 men, its numbers decimated by starvation, desertion, and illness. Cornwallis's British force, camped at nearby Salem, North Carolina, consisted of approximately 2,500 men. After attempts to raise nearby militia failed, Green knew he had few options but retreat north into Virginia. But it was a decision that required ceding North Carolina to the British, at least temporarily. And this council was more about political cover than strategic decision. His senior officers, Daniel Morgan, Isaac Ugey, and Maryland Colonel Otho Holland Williams, agreed. There was no option but Virginia. To the lower fords of the Dan River, near the modern-day John H. Kerr Reservoir, they would retreat. But all the men gathered inside Guilford Courthouse that day, and surely the starving soldiers camped in the nearby fields knew it would be a desperate chase. Cornwallis's crack British troops, mostly regulars, accompanied by the feared dragoons of, British, of Bannister Tarleton's British Legion, following closely on their heels, only waiting for an opportunity to annihilate the fleeing Americans. In many ways, this race to the Dan River began three months before, when General Nathaniel Green relieved Horatio Gates of command of the Continental Army's Southern Department at headquarters in Charlotte, North Carolina, on December 3rd. Gates had been humiliated in defeat at the Battle of Camden on August 16, 1780, and many gathered for the transfer of power anticipated conflict between Gates, Washington's biggest rival, and his successor, Green, known by all as a devoted Washington protege. But those anticipating conflict were disappointed, and Green soon went to work training and outfitting his new command, which included experienced officers like the Mar Maryland officer, Otho Holland Williams, and John Eager Howard, and also the South Carolina general, Isaac Ugey. And perhaps most talented of all was the Virginian, Daniel Morgan, who had distinguished himself in this stunning American victory at Saratoga in 1777. A distant cousin of George Washington, named William Washington, commanded cavalry, and more horsepower was on the way, in the guise of Henry Lee, the firebrand Virginian who had been awarded his own legion, or mixed regiment of mounted dragoons and light infantry. Despite these talented leaders, however, Green discovered a tattered and hungry army of only 2,300 men at Charlotte, and only 1,100 of those ex the experienced and enlisted Continentals, the rest volunteer militia. 
I find the troops in a most wretched condition, destitute of everything necessary for the comfort or convenience of soldiers, Green complained to Thomas Jefferson. But what Green lacked in manpower, he made up for in logistics. A talented administrator who had recently ended a prolonged stint as the Continental Army's quartermaster general, Green was obsessed with understanding the Carolinas' rivers and roads, sending several expeditions to document the Catawba, Yadkin, P.D., and Dan rivers, even as he was traveling south to relieve Gates. It was an investment in reconnaissance that would soon pay important dividends during the ensuing campaign. Opposing this wretched army was British Major General Charles Cornwallis, preparing for a winter invasion of North Carolina with his 2,500 men. It was a plan long delayed by bad luck and bad planning, and also the unexpected resistance of American militia. Cornwallis's grip on the South seemed irrevocable when he totally defeated Gates at Camden on August 16, 1780. But he failed to capitalize on that momentum, delayed by malaria and the determined resistance of Patriot militia, including the stunning defeat of Patrick Ferguson at King's Mountain on October 7th. But recently reinforced, Cornwallis was now finally ready to commence the long-planned invasion with plans to annihilate Green's Continental Army. Meanwhile, Greene made a surprising move to split his army, sending Daniel Morgan and the cavalry of William Washington, along with some of his best Continental soldiers from Maryland and Delaware, 600 men in all, to threaten Cornwallis's western flank, while he moved with the bulk of the army to Chira, South Carolina, to drill and refit. Morgan's orders were to spirit up the people, annoy the enemy, and collect provisions in that part of the country. Though authorized to use force if warranted, he was to act with caution and avoid surprises by every possible precaution. On December 25, 1780, Morgan established camp at Grindle Shoals, a well-known crossing on the Packlet River near modern-day Spartanburg, South Carolina and started drawing militia from western South Carolina to his command. At first, Cornwallis ignored this inferior force, but when William Washington's cavalry, with support from the mounted militia, surprised and routed a Tory force at Hammond's store on December 29th, Cornwallis realized Morgan threatened his invasion plans and dispatched against him his talented cavalry commander, Bannister Tarleton, commander of the British Legion. Cornwallis and Tarleton planned a coordinated attack against Morgan, but the impetuous Tarleton pushed forward, forcing Morgan to retreat to a local meeting place known as the Calpins. Arriving there on the evening of January 16th, Morgan instinctively realized he could use the terrain of the wooded grassland to his advantage, positioning his militia and continentals around contours in the landscape to mask their disposition. Tarleton marched hard during the night, arriving at the edge of the Calpens field early on January 17th. The night before, Morgan had concocted his famous battlefield alignment, in place long before Tarleton arrived early that morning. Near the bottom of the field, where Tarleton emerged from the woods, was a line of skirmishers and sharpshooters, followed by a line of militia fighters under the overall command of South Carolina militia leader Andrew Pickens. In the rear, he placed his veteran Continentals atop a ridge near the northern end of the wooded field. William Washington and the Continental Cavalry, along with some mounted militia, were held in reserve. Much has been written about the ingenuity of this alignment. The profession of arms does not often attract innovative minds, writes one historian. Morgan was the only general in the American Revolution on either side to produce a significant tactical thought. And Morgan knew his, appoint, uh, his opponent, at least by reputation, 
Renowned for the swift, abrupt charge he had used to, dev to devastating effect at the wax saws earlier in the summer, Tarleton's tactic seems to have been born a stronger affinity to the ferocity of the bloodhound than to the bravery of the bulldog, agrees another Morgan historian. Morgan's plan worked to perfection. Upon seeing only the Whig militia of the Carolinas opposing him, Tarleton rushed his 1,100 troops into battle. Failing to rest his exhausted men or devise adequate plans for turning Morgan's open flanks. As devised, Pickens' militia fired a few rounds before filtering back to the main continental line, expertly drawing Tarleton into Morgan's trap. The Continentals, under command of John Eager Howard, Howard, resisted the attack of the exhausted British troops, and William Washington's mounted reserve rushed into battle at two crucial moments. For the American cause, Calpin's was a victory complete. Though Tarleton escaped the battlefield with approximately 140 of his men, Morgan reported 110 British killed, including 10 officers and 200 wounded. In contrast, he reported only 12 Americans killed and 60 wounded. Most, <clears throat> most important were the 800 British prisoners, and Morgan knew Cornwallis would be eager to free them. He needed to get away fast, but which way to go? Even as the wounded were still being tended, Morgan collected the bulk of his men and wagons and moved off to the north, crossing the broad river at Island Ford and moving toward Gilbert Town, Gilbert Town near modern-day Rutherfordton, North Carolina, where roads led both east and west over the mountains. From Gilbert Town, according to 19th century historian David Schenck, Morgan intended, if Cornwallis got between him and Green, to retreat into or across the mountains if necessary, and either fight at some strong pass or make his way by a circuitous route into Virginia. But Cornwallis was delayed at Turkey Creek between modern-day Chester and York, South Carolina, still awaiting reinforcements, and would not start his pursuit of Morgan until January 19th, two days later, his force numbering 2,550 men, mostly British regulars, along with trained and experienced Hessians and some North Carolina volunteers. By then, Morgan was well on his way to the Catawba River, which he crossed on January 23rd, having sent his prisoners on a more northerly route toward the Moravian settlements near modern-day Winston-Salem. Failed by bad intelligence and incompetent scouts, Cornwallis blundered through the Carolina countryside, arriving at Ramsar's Mill on the outskirts of modern-day Lincolnton, North Carolina, on January 25th, four days behind Morgan. There, to increase the speed of his pursuit, Cornwallis's ordered, Cornwallis ordered the army's baggage burned, beginning with his own. Lord Cornwallis set the example by burning all his wagons and destroying the greatest part of his baggage, which was followed by every officer of the army without a single murmur, wrote Brigadier General Charles O'Hara commanding Cornwallis's crack brigade of British guards. In this situation, it was resolved to follow Green's army to the end of the world, O'Hara wrote. But first, Cornwallis had to cross the Catawba River, no simple task. For, since Calpins, Nathaniel Green had ridden across the Carolinas from Tara and was now directing American defenses on the river's east bank. Here, the explorations of the Carolinas' rivers he had instituted two months before began to pay dividends. That though General Green had never seen the Catawba before, he appeared to know more about it than those who were raised on it reported North Carolina Militia General William L. Davidson. 
who was left in charge of American defenses on the Catawba, while Morgan continued his retreat towards Salisbury, and Green attempted to raise North Carolina militia across the surrounding countryside. As Green presciently realized, Cornwallis decided to cross at Cowan's Ford, a small private crossing on the Catawba now submerged under Lake Norman. In the cold dawn of February 1, 1780, Cornwallis ordered his troops across the Catawba. There, Davidson's North Carolina militia awaited him, sniping at the British as they forded the cold river on foot. The enemy stood on the hills of the opposite shore, recalled British officer Roger Lamb, so they had every advantage over us to facilitate their firing. Even Cornwallis was in danger, his, sh his horse shot from under him, according to one account. The British lost 31 killed in the crossing, many of them drowned, but soon gained the eastern bank where Davidson was killed in the skirmishing. With their commanding officer dead, the remainder of the Americans scattered into the woods, leaving Cornwallis in control of the Catawba. After his attempt to organize militia had failed, Green raced back to Salisbury alone through the active war zone. Meanwhile, Bannister Tarleton routed North Carolina militia at Terrance Tavern and Cornwallis resumed his pursuit, allowing his angry troops to spread out over the countryside, smoke from burning homes on the horizon rising behind their march. For the first time in the American Revolution, the total warfare of arson, pillage, and destruction had come to North Carolina. But again, Cornwallis and his angry men arrived at Salisbury and the nearby trading ford on the Yadkin River too late. Having procured all the boats there in advance, Green had managed to direct his troops across the Yadkin in the nick of time, leaving Cornwallis once more stranded on the other side. Thanks to his superior reconnaissance, Green knew the Yadkin was not fordable at Salisbury after a recent rain. The following, Morgan, the following morning, Morgan broke camp, headed toward a, unis, a union with General Isaac Uge and the rest of the Continental Army at Guilford Courthouse, where Green hoped to gather local Patriot militia and make a stand against Cornwallis. For his part, Cornwallis needed an upstream ford to cross the Yadkin. Cornwallis assumed Green's plan was to escape North Carolina across the Dan River into the relative safety of Virginia, where the Continental Army could collect supplies and reinforcements. He had been informed by Loyalist spies it would be impossible for Green to escape across the Dan River by its lower fords because there were not enough boats there to carry him across the river. In fact, Green had already collected the boats on the Dan's lower ford and knew he could cross his army there if necessary. Therefore, he marched his troops north toward the Yadkin River shallow ford near the Moravian settlements around modern-day Winston-Salem, hoping to cut off Green near the Dan's upper fords. On the morning of February 8th, Cornwallis and his army crossed the Yadkin at Shallow Ford and marched through the Moravian settlements. The following day, February 9th, as Cornwallis camped near Salem, Green held his council of war. Green's effort to raise the militia of modern-day Forsyth and Guilford counties had mostly failed, and his officers agreed there was little else they could do but retreat into Virginia by the Dan's lower fords at Irwin and Boyd's Ferry. But to shield the army and deceive Cornwallis, Green would send the flying army on a more northerly course. Sadly, Daniel Morgan could no longer lead this force, the sciatica with which he had been suffering, finally too painful to endure. Command of Morgan's light troops then fell to Otho Holland Williams, an experienced combat veteran. 
also joining Williams in this flying army would be the dashing light horse of Harry Lee and his dragoons, along with the cavalry of William Washington, providing crucial mounted support for this partisan operation. Early in the morning of February 10, the Continental Army marched out of Guilford Courthouse in two detachments. With the main part of the army, its baggage, artillery, and accoutrement, Green set off on the road towards Irwin's and Boyd's Ferry, marching in a more northerly, northerly direction to deceive Cornwallis into believing Green was headed toward the upper fords, was Williams with the flying army, 700 men in all, what Green would call the flower of the army. William spent the night of February 10th anxious about being surprised. His troops had not eaten all day and longed for sleep, but Williams employed numerous patrols and pickets during the night, meaning many of his men began February 11th, hungry and without sleep. If February 10 had been the opening leg of the race to the Dan, the 11th was when the real action started. Here the narrative centers primarily on Henry Lee, who left the most complete account of the race to the Dan in his Revolutionary War memoir. While Lee's men tried to cook breakfast, they received news of a British patrol in their rear. Lee sent off scouts, and one of them, a young bugler, named Gillies, was killed by the British. Lee captured a British officer who was accused of the crime and ordered the officer's execution. But just then, the British vanguard appeared at Lee's rear, and the British prisoners were sent away to safety before Lee and his legion raced away. Probably later that same day, Lee tried to bivouac his legion for dinner at a local farm when the British vanguard again appeared in his rear. Lee reported the British gave chase through cultivated fields for a mile until Lee and his men managed to engineer another close escape. As the race to the dam continued, so did the misery. Officer and soldier alike suffered from sleep deprivation. On the fourth day of the march, Green reported he had not slept more than four hours since departing Guilford Courthouse. In, an, in another account by Green, he recalled that he and South Carolina governor in exile, John Rutledge, had one night shared a bed at the house of a local farm. During the night, each accused the other of kicking in their sleep until they discovered they had been joined in the bed by the family hog. William Seymour, a soldier in the, Delamere, in the Delaware Regiment, wrote, You must understand that we march for the most part both day and night, the British being close on our rear, so that we had not scarce time to cook. During the day, the frozen roads would thaw into a heavy mire, making the march miserable for horse and men. But yet again, Cornwallis was too slow to catch Green. During the day of February 14th, Green finally reached Irwin's Ferry, where the boats he had ordered collected were waiting for him. By 5.30, Green's army had successfully crossed the Dan, and by midnight, Henry Lee and his dragoons made it across, where they joined the rest of the Continental Army awaiting them. Far from acting as if they had just been pushed from the Carolinas in disgraceful retreat, the Americans celebrated on their side of the Dan as if they had won the World Series. Wrote Henry Lee, in the camp of Green, joy beamed in every face. The subsequent days to the reunion of the army on the north of the Dan were spent in mutual gratulations. Meanwhile, the British fumed. Arriving at the Dan about 12 hours later, O'Hara with the British vanguard could only stare across the swollen river at, at the celebrating Americans. Frustrated by the Continental Army's narrow escape, Cornwallis turned and marched to Hillsboro, North Carolina, arriving there on February 20th, where he issued a proclamation calling in the region's loyalists. 
At first they came by the hundreds, but their presence soon diminished, then stopped. Cornwallis soon learned why. On February 22nd, Greene had recrossed the Dan with his army. Greene may have won the race to the Dan, but the campaign that would culminate at the Battle of Guilford Courthouse had already begun. You may be assured that your retreat before Lord Cornwallis is highly applauded by all ranks and reflects much honor on your military abilities, wrote George Washington to Nathaniel Greene. Greene had drawn Cornwallis and the British Army 240 miles from their nearest base of supply. On the chase, the British had burned most of their baggage and stores at Ramsour's Mills two weeks before and now their own clothes and shoes were almost as tattered and rotten as the Americans. Worse yet, the Loyalist militia promised them never materialized, leaving him with only 1,900 troops to fight at Guilford Courthouse. Green more than doubled the size of his army in the same battle, adding over 2,600 militia and volunteers to his 1,600 Continentals. At Guilford Courthouse on March 15th, Cornwallis forced Green to withdraw from the field of battle, despite being outnumbered two to one. Green had lost yet another battle, but this was anything but a victory, for Cornwallis had failed again to destroy Green's army, and with 93 dead and 493 wounded, over a quarter of his own army suffered in casualties, he had little appetite for another go at Green. His intentions now turned to Virginia, where he was soon to be trapped and surrendered at Yorktown later that October. This has been only a brief overview of the story of the race to the Dan. Much more about this remarkable chapter in American history awaits inside the book. Thank you for your attention to today's presentation.